The following is a special presentation of the Decibel Geek Podcast. the scenes look at some of your favorite records the stories behind the songwriting as well as the recording circumstances broken down for you and explained by a key player in the album's creation track by track memory by memory this is albums unleashed alice cooper's dada with special guest dick wagner wow with an intro like that you know this is going to be fun today Welcome back, everybody, once again. This is the Decibel Geek Podcast. I'm Aaron Camaro, joined, as always, by Chris Sinzak. How's it going, my friend? Doing great. Really excited to uh, share this new thing we're doing with everybody. Yeah, we, we always are talking about new ideas and different things we can do, you know, and, and we like to do the year in reviews, and we like to do Radio Sucks radio shows, but we're always looking to expand and, and try to take new perspectives on hard rock and heavy metal, and I think we're on to something here today. Yeah, I, I do want to quickly mention on the uh, Facebook.com slash Decibel Geek page, we had a lot of really good feedback. Feedback. I asked for feedback just in general on the show, and yeah. um, thank you guys. A lot of a lot of interesting stuff, good and bad, and we want to hear it all, and we appreciate it. And uh, you know, we're 134 episodes in, and we're trying something brand new, so that's kind of cool. Yeah. But uh, yeah, this is a, a thing we're going to do called Albums Unleashed, and this is the first installment of that. And uh, we have more planned for this year. And basically, what it is is we're going to take an album that either is uh, it's a classic legendary album or it could be an album that's kind of an undiscovered gem and th in this case it's a little bit of both yeah. um this album did not do great um sales wise when it came out because it, it kind of came out in a lost era this is alice cooper's da da and um but it's become kind of a cult favorite among uh listeners over the years especially people like me who just got into alice in the past few years right and the thing about this album is it's like you say it's kind of a lost treasure where a lot of people don't really talk about it and i think that's the the idea behind why we chose this one yeah and because we had a chance we talked to dick wagner in the past and he was such a great guy and basically this whole thing is just an excuse to get dick wagner back on the show sure he came <laughs> he uh he, he came into nashville about a little over a month ago and um when i knew he was coming to town first i was excited to meet him finally in person and see him perform live and um if you listen to the bonus track that come out later this week we go into that yeah um but uh when he when he it was announced that he was coming i was i had the, i had been thinking about this album's unleashed idea for a while and i was like he's the the perfect guy to kick, to kick this off with. And I right. asked him, and I was like, you want to do Dada? And he said, yes. Um, and it went great. And um, he was, you know, more than forthcoming. So you're going to hear, like, a lot of ambient noise because we were actually meeting in a hotel lobby to do right. this. Um, but you can hear everything nice and clear. That's kind of cool, though. I always like that ambiance when we're doing interviews. Right. And, um, you know, and the, the, another reason to do this one is uh, the first one is there's not a lot known about this album. You know, Alice Cooper himself has said in many interviews this is kind of his blackout period, and he doesn't remember even making this album. Right. Yeah, so, I've read that. So, you know, of, of all, and Bob Ezrin is, is legendarily known as. Uh, he was going through some issues, too, at this time, and so was Dick, but I think Dick probably has the most lucid memory of making this record. Right, and that speaks for why this album is the way it is. Yeah, it's a classic album, and uh, so we've got a lot to get to. Um, before we get into that, I'm not going to have time to do the Geeks of the Week this week, the people that retweeted and shared the 420 episode. Um, a lot of you did, and I will go ahead and tell you that we will mention all of those next week. And if you want to be Geek of the Week next week, this is how we do it if you're a first-time listener. If you like this episode and you want to help spread the word about the show and help help us build our listenership, because it's all you guys that do it, um, just either share on Facebook the link to this episode or uh, retweet the link on Twitter. Right. And um, that's basically, it's word of mouth. We're trying to do this grassroots style, and we get more listeners every week when you guys do it. It really right. does not go unnoticed. We really appreciate so it. So if you do did it last week and you also do it this week, you're all going to get mentioned next week. You will. Awesome. Along with that, you mentioned the uh, SoundCloud, the bonus track that we do. You know, that's going to be coming out. We took a little extra time with Dick yeah. Wagner to talk about the show he put on here in Nashville. Right. The only way you're getting invited to that is to be involved in the conversation at Facebook. So mm -hmm. join up with us on Facebook. Yep. Also check out our website, www.decibelgeek.com. You can do all kinds of stuff there. Order your Decibel Geek shirt, tip your DJs, go to uh, Amazon, yep. or order the Dada album on Amazon. You're going to want to after this is yeah, over. Just go, go through, through our link on the website because you're going to help us 
keep the lights on here and keep this show going on for free. While you're there, you're going to find all kinds of great articles, and it's just an awesome website. You're going to love it. And absolutely. And um, if you haven't had a chance to check it out, I hope this will also lead you to buy Dick's book. It's called Not Only Women Bleed, and it's, a, it's an excellent memoir. Indeed. And like we said, go, th- go through the link on the Decibel Geek website and uh, order the book, order the CD, order and all this stuff. Absolutely. Buy a car, buy, yeah. a, buy an airplane. Absolutely. And we get a kickback from that. Um, and just real quick, some business. Um, we mentioned, we, we go over a review I found on the internet of, of Dada where somebody had t- kind of formulated their own theories on what the album meant. Yeah. Um, and I want to give credit where that's due. Yeah, for sure. The, it was written on a site called ultimate-guitar.com, and I'll put the link in the show notes, but it was just written by a person with the username madpaperboy89. And you can tell by this article, and the, the reason why we used it is because this guy is a true, passionate Alice Cooper fan. Yeah, and it was written all the way back in January 2008. So if, if you are the person that wrote this, um, get in touch with us because we want to give you full credit because it's a really interesting theory, and you'll enjoy Dick's reactions to the theories. Yeah, So um, as will everybody else. Links to all of this stuff, how you can order a T-shirt, all that stuff. So we got a lot to get to, so let's get to our talk with Dick Wagner. This is Dada, Albums Unleashed. Let's do it. the Dada album because it was done in, under such strange circumstances. Yeah, that's why we wanted to talk to you about this because you're basically the principal songwriter on this album. I am, and, and I play guitar and bass. Okay, and so kind of take us back to how this got this album got going because from what I remember reading, um, Alice was in Arizona and was really not interested in doing an album at the time. And you had to kind of, didn't Ezra basically send you down there to get him to come up to Toronto for this? That's right. That's right. So he was supposed to make one more album for Warner Brothers. And so it was the last album for Warner Brothers, and he was not going. He and Ezra were having a kind of a fallout about whether he would record in Toronto or whether they would come down to Phoenix and record down there. Yeah. Bob wanted him to be in Toronto. Bob didn't want to leave his family and his surroundings. Alice didn't want to leave his family and his surroundings. There was no material written yet, and so they were at a crossroads there, and Warner Brothers needed one more album. So Bob called me up and he said, "Uh, look, will you go to Phoenix and try to get Alice to write and get him to commit to coming to Toronto to record? Mm -hmm. And I said, all right, I'll do it. I think I was living in... uh, I forget where I was living at the time. Might have been New York, I'm not sure, but I went I went to Phoenix and went to Alice's house and I stayed there with him and every day. I'd bring out the guitar or the keyboard and I'd start writing. And I started coming up with titles and I started thinking about this is his last Warner Brothers album, so let's have a character called Formerly Warner. Mm-hmm. So that's where that comes yeah. from. That's the, you know, <laughs> when you former, said that to me earlier, formerly right, Warner like Brothers. Right, because yeah. he's about to be done with that. So he was, this was going to be an album about leaving Warner Brothers, you know, in some way. Right. So I came up with this title and a couple of other titles from this album and started writing songs. And Alice wasn't doing anything. I mean, he was just, I don't know if he was like immobile at the time or really seriously not interested but he finally came out of vegetation and came into the living room where I was writing and started writing with me and so the songs started to roll out and uh, we created a few songs in the meantime Alice's manager uh, came up with 90 grand from someone from Warner Brothers maybe I don't know but to entice Alice to go ahead and make this record yeah so he got the money. I got him starting writing songs. And together, he and I went to Toronto. And it was the wintertime in Toronto. It's unpleasant in the wintertime in Toronto. Well, especially coming from Arizona. Yeah. Yeah, it's a shock. Exactly. Coming up, you know, laying by the pool. And right. All that. So we go to Toronto and we rent this uh, two-bedroom suite. In, in, I think it was in the Hilton Hotel. 
So he had one room and I had another, and there was a living room in between where we could get together and do a little bit of writing. So we would write a song and then the next day record it. But we were really getting drunk every night and just drinking all this vodka and vodka and vodka. So both of you were in pretty excessive uh, on the, the drinking at that point. I'm telling you, I, I wasn't. I'm not a drinker at all. I still don't drink. Uh huh. But I was trying to go along with the program here. Yeah. To, yeah. You know, keep him happy and keep him writing. And it was working. So was he very temperamental at this point? Like, as far no. as getting him to work on things? No, not at all. He's always very very cool about that because he, he likes to write too yeah and uh, that was the first time that Alice and I spent time really talking about his life my life you know like becoming really closer friends mm -hmm. yeah through a lot of revelations which which I won't go into here but uh, we got to know each other much more we're always very successful at writing because it just comes so naturally and we think alike and we have the same kind of humor and so we got a bunch of songs finished, recorded. We'd go down the next day, go to the studio, record, we'd finish. We'd go back to the hotel and go down to the dining uh, lounge area where we'd have dinner. And then uh, usually every night we'd go over to the piano, and I'd play piano, and he and I would sing. You know, some of the hits or whatever we could, would think of to entertain all the people in the Wow. The so the people in the lounge had no idea no. that they were in what they were in for when they were hanging no. out in there. No. <laughs> was there a lot of people there that had like no idea who you guys even were? Oh I, no, they, I think pretty much everybody knows Alice Cooper. I mean, yeah. His face is very recognizable. Right. They don't know me from Adam, but they're learning to. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we'd go play the piano and sing. It was great. People responded. They loved it. We'd do that. We'd drink, we'd sing, we'd play. Then we'd go upstairs to the suite and write. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was working. The um, album was working. At this diner, we would have, there were these two waitresses, one a tall blonde, beautiful blonde. One a tall redhead, beautiful redhead. And they wore these black dresses that were slid up the side all the way up to their ass. <laughs> and they, were, they, were, they would wait on us. They were very lovely. One night, we're back at the hotel upstairs, and we were going to write a song about these two girls. So, the concept, uh, Scarlet and Sheba, mm -hmm. right. came up. The blonde was Sheba, and the Scarlet was the red. So we were, we were writing the song, we wrote the song, and then it was time to drink heavily and then go to bed. So it, like 10 o'clock in the morning, there's a knock on the door of the uh, the suite. And I heard the knocking, and I got out, went to the front door, opened it up, and here were the two girls mm -hmm. standing there. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. Each one of them holding a piece of black forest coat. And they said, do you want a piece? <laughs> <laughs> there's some temptation for and you. And I'm going like, there's a double entendre there. Yeah. So I said, come on in. Come on in. And Alice came out of his room and sat the girls down and said, listen, we wrote a song about you. <laughs> You're immortalized. So we'll sing it for you, and we did. And Scarlet and Sheba from that album. Yeah. And it's really about uh, dominatrix kind of sex. And, right. Uh -huh. Yeah. You tell you from know, the lyrics for sure. And the girls are like, oh my god, wow. 
Were they flattered were they liked or mortified? It or? <laughs> I think they were mortified. <laughs> they were mortified, but they were flattered. By sure. It. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But they they came there to get laid, and they didn't get laid. Oh. But they got a song written about them. They got a song oh, written yeah. about them, you know. So, um, no, the policy was, you know, we, we didn't, didn't really have women coming around to disturb the writing and create problems. And Alice was, was married at the time. I mean, married at the time, still is. Right. But um, the same girl, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't going to do anything with these girls anyway. Me... Might have, you know. <laughs> but we were basically just being good guys right. and write, writing a song about these girls, which we recorded that day, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's part of the Dada album too, the Scarlet and Sheba story. That's one of my favorite uh, songs on the record. Yeah, I kind of love the the Middle Eastern vibe you yeah. put in on that. Where did that I, where did that sound come from? Esmond created it on something. Now you were mentioning a synthesizer or something. You you mentioned Alice and Bob were having a stalemate about where they wanted to record this thing. Did did that boil over into the studio? Were they not getting along while this no, was No, no, they were fine. They, they were? were fine. Okay. Once we got to Toronto and got locked into the fact that we were doing it, there was no problem. Good. There was okay. no problem. There was always a creative process. Right. So that's all we were doing is creating. I was doing a little more on the production side on this record, and uh, I played all the guitars and I played bass on the record. Mm -hmm. So I, I did quite a bit on this record, including write, writing it. And uh, I love the songs on Dada. I mean, I, I think that they're just really uh, experimental and beautiful. They have no purpose in life commercially. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you can tell that for sure. There's nothing to, we didn't make any attempts to like write a hit song or, or do any of that. It was just this concept of the old man in the attic. That's what I was going to say, because at that time, you know, Bob Ezrin's pretty known for, like, coming, getting together with bands and doing these concept albums, like albums that tell a whole story yeah. within it, you know, like The Wall, like uh, Music from the Elder, from Kiss. And this album, Dada, seems to really have some kind of, like, a theme to it where it's like a concept album. Does this, does it, it all fit together, of, tell a story? More or less, I think it, yeah, it does. You know, and really, it's, it's all about... The, um, it's all from the idea of being formerly with Warner Brothers. This was the slap in the face for Warner Brothers, but with this character in the attic. So you guys felt like, you know, since you really didn't give two shits about what Warner Brothers thought about you at this point, that you're free to do pretty much whatever you want, well, yeah. right? And we did. It was a very loose album in the sense that it had no hits. It had no attempt to be successful. It was just the music we wanted to make. Every day. Yeah, because because Warner didn't get behind it at all promotion wise. They just buried it basically. That was it. That was the last album. It was yeah. Over. So you guys kind of knew when you were making it, they're not going to push this anyway. Right? Well, we kind of figured they wouldn't. Right. Right. So, um, yeah, because I was going to ask you about the theme of it because there's a lot of interesting theories out there about the concept of this album mm -hmm. because Alice hasn't talked at length about it. And there's what, what, what are the uh, well, there's, the theories? Uh, there's one I brought. This guy wrote a very long thing about what he thought each song meant. And I'm not going to read the entire thing verbatim. Let me read it. Well, let's see. I don't have my glasses. Let me check well, I mean, I'll tell you, it's like he says, da, the al all right, the opening track, Dada, he says, the creeping opening with Bob Ezrin talking to Alice, apparently pretending to be a psychologist, asking about the man's son, Sonny. Right. When he applies that Sonny is the man's daughter, showing the dehumanizational tactics his dad uses to break Sonny emotionally. That's pretty close. Yeah, is it? Yeah. I think this guy, if this isn't true, it's a great concept if you didn't come up with well, it. Well, I think that that's pretty much what it was. Well, the, th the, the main theory he had was this is basically a story of a, a, of a mentally disturbed person with multiple personalities, yeah. and the songs kind of represent these different personalities. Yeah, I guess maybe you could say that, too. Right. So, um, not so much being a multiple personality, but being completely mixed up about who he was. Right. He didn't know if he was the daughter or the son. I mean, he, he wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. Neither was the father, the old man. They didn't quite know what, what gender he was. Or, and, and that's really the story of Alice Cooper. Mm -hmm. People right. Know, well, he's a woman or a, girl, or, a, or a man when he first started out. You know, yeah, the androgynous thing. Right, the yeah. androgynous thing. So. Right. Well, and then, you know, like, uh, one song that's interesting is Enough's Enough. Yeah, um, 
the uh, it's it's kind of a it sounds like a lighthearted song musically. Yeah, it's upbeat. And, but the yeah. subject matter is very stark in contrast. Yeah. You know, because about a man basically whoring his child out. Is it, is that? I mean, well, no, not that. I mean, he's he's cruel to his son. Is that what it is? Uh, yeah. Because I'm talking about his mother dying and and stuff like that. Yeah, it just, what his dad did to his mother. Okay. You know, so the son is reflecting on what the dad did to the mother and therefore to him and right enough enough's enough you know I've had enough of you dad so yeah because like the line go fucking fuck and make a buck I mean like yeah. some people are like is that child prostitution or, or what does that mean you know it's a uh, I guess it could be it wasn't really thought of that way and I think that really, really the words are go buck and buck and make a buck gotcha go buck and fuck and make a buck Okay. You know, but it sounds like fuck. Yeah, because yeah, it does sound like fuck. Because I'm thinking for 1983, that's pretty damn controversial. Yeah, you know? yeah. Go <laughs> so. fuck and fuck and make a buck. Yeah. No, I think it was buck. And he was a little cowboy, so. Right. Go buck and buck and make a buck. Right. Yeah. I got that you. That was dad's command to him to go off and, you know, do whatever and make a dollar, whatever. Right, right. And then on. But, but it's interpreted as fuck and fuck, and so it's, you know, child prostitution. So I got. No, it wasn't meant that way. It was misinterpreted. Hmm. Okay. Misinterpreted. So I'm glad we have you here to clear up some of this stuff. Yeah, okay. Okay, so for Formerly Warmer, which you've already explained what that, behind that, this guy's theory, because I think you'll want to hear this. He says, again, we have the father's perspective. Describing the family secret that his brother is some kind of fa some kind of hideous freak locked in an attic. And he's sound he hears through the walls like an out-of-tune piano slowly driving him crazy. No, not really. Not really. <laughs> okay. Is that is that character that's in the attic, you know, and, and saying that, you know, based on the idea that this is a character driven, you know, these songs are very character driven, yeah. is that supposed to be the same guy from Welcome to My Nightmare? Like the Steven? one in the attic? Is that Steven? Is there a tie in there? Well it could be. I mean, you know, I mean you could look at it that way, but I don't think it was meant that way. I mean, once again, this started from me sitting there and getting this idea of formerly warmer mm -hmm. as being formerly Warner Brothers. Right. right. You know, so so it starts from that. And then Alice actually made it a character in the attic. So okay. formerly warmer pulls up the covers to hide in his wrinkled bed. No dreams go in, no dreams go out of the hole in his wrinkled head. When I first started writing it, I had no idea it was going to be a character in the attic. Mm -hmm. It was just a song title to get us, get the whole thing rolling. Mm -hmm. okay. and you hear it in the uh, in the, the uh, interaction between Bob and Alice on the introduction. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the psychiatrist talking to the guy, and he has no idea who he is, whether his son is a male or female. He he's seriously whacked. Right. Because like you said, you know, he says, you know, I have a son. No, you don't. Yeah. You know, yeah. like that. You, know, you have a daughter. Yeah. Yeah. No. So this is the guy in the attic, and he's, he's obviously a musician. He plays this old piano thing. Mm -hmm. he's, he has a hole in his head for some reason. I forget what that's about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, well, you mentioned the, on the, the opening track. I gotta say, I didn't hear this album when I was a child when this came out. Good and thing, I, good thing you did. <laughs> and it's a good thing I didn't because that's one of the scariest sounding things is that opening track. Oh. And what is it? What is causing that ricochet sound on that song with that the, the reverberating sound that, like the slamming sound on? What did, what what did you guys do to make that sound? You know, I don't remember how how that happened. I mean, was that something Ezrin had pretty much put together? Yeah, it's, it's Ezrin's thing, probably. Yeah. yeah. And that's his daughter yeah. doing the dad-dad? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
That's yeah. it. He loves to get his kids involved in his albums. He doesn't always he? does. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, to me, it's that's very self-indulgent. But Bob, you did a great job. Right. Yeah. Well, for people that don't know, what is it like to work to work on an album with him? It's a, a mixed blessing. I mean, I love the guy. He's a great producer. Um, We've had our conflicts, but at the same time, you know, we shared a great history. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he calls me the guy, he, his most called upon musician during the 70s and 80s. Absolutely. And that's true. And he relied on me for a lot of things. Right. From arranging to songwriting to guitar playing to just being a general part of the direction of where things went. He's very, uh, what would you call it, um, dominant in the studio. He wants everything under his control. Right. And his control methods with me a few times were a, a little excessive, but... We're talking like lots of takes on certain things till he got it the way he wanted it? No, I'm just uh, attitudes. Right. Do it my way, or, you know. Or that's it, yeah. It seems and like... You know, and, and you don't tell me to do it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You yeah. Know, I mean, I'm very much an individual, and I've got my own feelings about my songs, and um, some of the songs were complete, and things were added. Not that they're bad, they're good, but, mm -hmm. you know, I always came to the table with a lot of music. Right. And uh, I think I, I got a lot of it in there. Yeah. It seems like Bob has, like, a picture or something in, in his vision, and he's unwavering from that. It's like, this is what I picture, well, this is what the way you it got has is to you be. Got, you got Alice Cooper, who has vision. Right. right. You have Bob Ezrin, who has vision. Mm -hmm. yeah, and Dick you have Wagner. me, who yeah. has vision. So That's a lot. Most of those visions come together into one thing. Yeah. It's not often easy. Right. It takes a lot of work. And some it's conflict smallest. comes along with and that. There's conflict with it, but you have to have conflict with conflict resolution right you know and so we always tried to find a way mm -hmm. and we always did right you know so there's no hard feelings about anything well the results speak for themselves yeah right? and the results speak for themselves I mean a lot of these records I wish I'd sold more yeah just for me not for the money but for so people could hear some of this music well it's the art you want to you want people to because hear there's, the some, there's some you know if you dig down into some of these records there's some really great stuff absolutely oh yeah yeah and uh i think it's kind of cool that's what that's basically what we're doing here today sure it's been many many years since this albums came out but you know that's what we try to do when we're talking about you know these albums we're talking to guys like yourself and say hey you know that might have been quite a while ago but these albums if you put it on for the first time it's still brand new to you you know, you, you owe right. it to yourself That's to check right. it out, and we want to bring more information about some yeah. of these lost gems that, you know, yeah. when people talk about Alice Cooper, you know, a lot of times they don't bring up the Dada album, you know, because it's kind of lost, in, kind of lost in the discography it, yeah, a little yeah, bit. It's down there. It's not the most popular or the biggest seller, and, but it's got a certain genius to it. That, yeah. yeah, and I will say it's, it's becoming a cult favorite, because yeah. uh, if you read online, I, people that are discovering Alice just now saying, I just found that out, it's amazing, you know, because yeah. uh, people are, are starting to finally embrace it. It is amazing, you know? it's an amazing record. And it, come, it came out at a time where it definitely does not sound like a 1983 album. I mean, yeah. I don't know what era it sounds, but it's got its own sound to it. It has no uh, era, you know? I don't no. think it has any era involved in it at I mean, you can't even really pin it down to a genre even, you can't say this no. is a hard rock album, or this is this, or no, this is isn't. that, I mean, you can't, no. peg, you can't pin it down. It's like, it's like a... The Dada era, it's just there and it's real and it stands on its own, it has no, it's ageless, I think. That record has no age to it. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. You know, every time I hear it, it's like, wow, we did that. Yeah. It's, it, it, it amazes yeah. me. It stands out from the pack, especially from the other albums, like the three that came before it. Like, you know, Flush the Fashion, Zipper Catch a Skin, and Special Forces all had a certain yeah. cohesiveness. This Zipper stands Catch out for Skin had a, had a cocaine overdraft on it. it yeah. It was a high-speed record. Right. This one settled into a, something great. It's, a, it's almost like an avant-garde type thing. You know, it's like... It's, it's it, yeah, so yeah, edgy. It's like hard rock almost. It, yeah. is, is that where the title comes from? Dada? Dada? Yeah. yeah. Who, comes, who came up with that idea? With that, the name, I the think name. Alice Cooper. He did. Okay. 
and that was to tie in with the art form of yeah. being right. abstract yeah. and yeah, exactly. I mean it's a perfect title for an album like that because yeah. that's yeah. really what it is yeah. it's it's da da you know you can, can't pin down that kind of art and say this right. is a certain kind of art because right. it's so da-da-esque. far out there and different yeah. right. it applies and to this perfectly that cover, whoever come up with that cover is perfect yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that because I look at the cover and you know that looks like Alice right it there is, right? Is, that a, it is. is that you sitting next to him is no, that no that's not me because I didn't think it really both? looked like you were trying to figure Alice out who too. the other oh they're both that's Alice both. Yeah. that's the two characters yeah. it's a it's it's quite a, a piece of artwork. It is you know. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. He wants you to sign that before you leave. Heck yeah. Well, <laughs> let me do that now. Okay. You, got, you have a pen? No, I will have to find a we'll pen. Get one I had one, but I done. lost it. All right. Yeah. Then I'll sign it. But um, track four, No Man's Land. Um, Love this song. The, yeah. the, the opening line is genius. <laughs> I know. <laughs> got a, a job as a Santa at a mall in Atlanta. Right. Not for any talent, but because I was the only one the suit would fit. Yeah. <laughs> I got a job in Atlanta in a mall playing Santa, not because of any talent, but because I was the only one the suit would fit. It's way out of time. It's, uh, it's not an ordinary chorus verse thing. It's just that line, it just goes on longer than it should. Right. And, but it really ends it just uh, That line makes me fucking cry. Yeah. It's just so good. It is. It's a great song. Yeah, a song. It's got a different. You're right. It's got a different kind of flow to it than than a normal song that you would think. Yeah, it it's does. just. It does. It's like it's off by a little bit, but that's kind of what makes it great. It is. It's exactly right. She said, Now, who, who comes up with the idea of this mall Santa in Atlanta? Is that Alice? Alice Cooper. Uh, only Alice Cooper would come up with that. That's right. I mean, that's, it's, that's a genius it's of genius. Alice. He comes up with things that are just otherworldly. And the, the guy that had the interesting multiple personality theory, he he makes some good points on this because he brings up the line, She didn't notice I was thin with a delicate chin, nor the softest of my skin, nor the scent of my other personalities. She didn't see through my disguise, didn't see it in my eyes. She was in for a surprise when she discovered my emotional plurality. Plurality, yeah. So that's, clever. that's an interesting Oh, that's great. Thing, yeah. You know. yeah, he was a multiple personality there. Right, and there she'd have to learn to love all four of me. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> awesome. it's, it's, it's just genius lyric writing, you know. And um, and musically, it's great. You had those backup singers on the on the yeah. chorus part, yeah. you know, yeah. almost like a, almost a Motownish type right. thing, you know. Right. So yeah, so um, just special memories of recording. I want to steal, man. <laughs> yeah, it was just that was a fun song. Yeah, it is. I, I love recording that song. I think it could have been actually recorded better. Oh really? Yeah, I, I would like to have the track be a little more. Heavy rock, right? A little more. Yeah, it it does come off a little bit more popish. Than yeah, it's a little, a little bit more. And you can tell by listening to it, it would have lended itself pretty good to be, you know, a little bit heavier, a little crunchier with the guitars. Yeah, it could yeah. Have had heavier guitars. That could call for a cover version, right? Yeah, it'd be very interesting to see if anyone would ever cover something like that. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, so dyslexia is next. And, uh, that is the strangest song. Yeah, yeah, it is. for sure. It's, it really stands out from the back. But that that was the the whole foundation for that song was Graham Shaw and his synthesizers. So it started with that feel and that it developed into a, the song it is. But Graham was like new to the writing team, he said. Right. And so his input was different. And. Uh, I think it's good too, but the song does not move me in the same way. Right. Well, it's clever. Right. It di- is this love or dyslexia? Yeah. Right. It's, it's, cl- it's, it's mildly, a clever line. Mildly, mildly clever. Right. And it's, it, this is the only song that I can hear a little bit of 1983 because the synthesizer yeah, yeah, was very exactly. in vogue at that time. And, and, right. And he did those kind of rhythms. And,
But this is a very self-contained album because it's basically you, Bob, Alice, and then this guy chiming right. in a little bit. Right. But you guys were the main people running this show. Right. right. So maybe that's why it has such a, a stand, such a interesting sound because there's there's not too many cooks in the kitchen on this one. Right. You know. Um, so then, as we mentioned, Scarlet and Sheba, which. I, I do not understand I don't understand how any of these songs haven't been played live by Alice this one in particular would really yeah. benefit from like a heavy live rendition oh yeah this song could really kick ass live it could really kick ass yeah yeah cause it's, it's the drumming is great and uh, yeah. while we're on the drumming this was kind of using like uh, computerized drumming and then live drumming on top is that how right. you did it right well we did it's the Fairlight mm -hmm. um, synthesizer and we did a lot of the basic tracks with that and then brought in, I forget even who played drums, but we brought in drummers to play mm -hmm. live over the top of it, which a lot of people do today. Right. Do the synthesizer tracks, play live drums over the top, and you get the combination of the two. Yeah. You know, because kids today, if you're making a record, they want things to be quantized and in time. They all have to feel perfect. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. and it's, it's it's almost sterile. Now. It, it's sterile Sanitized. for me. I mean, yeah, there's no you, raw emotion. But when you add the live drums, then you then you pick up the live feel mm -hmm. along with the synthesizer. So it's good to use the both. Yeah, that did that gave it its own sound. Well, with all this pop music that is strictly synthesized and quantized and in time, it's too perfect. I mean, yeah, sounds good if you're just listening for melodies and stuff. But right. Uh, or if you just want a straight pulse that is perfect, mm -hmm. but bands don't play perfect. Well, rock and roll isn't about that. No, it yeah, isn't it's about not that. It's almost perfect. what's not perfect is what makes it great. Exactly. Well, and it does in every track that you know because you find mistakes and you find little things in records that actually make the record feel right. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, it's more personalized that way. Yeah. You, know, so you don't feel like you just bought this album out of a vending machine. I just did a show last night in, in Nashville, and uh, you guys were at the show. Yeah, so yeah we, so we had you know, a great time. You know, I mean, it certainly was far from perfect, but we only had two days of rehearsal. You I mean, couldn't tell. These yeah, guys, I'd never be able to These know. guys, are, they're a great band. I would love to take them back to Phoenix with me and have them be my band. Oh, yeah. But they, they play with Pat Travers most of the time. And uh, in the two days, I, I arrived at the first rehearsal, and... They'd already rehearsed and they already had it ready. Yeah. So I, I had very little to do except learn how to play again. Well, that's good Nashville musicians for you. Yeah, yeah. So I threw a couple curves at them and uh, by the time we finally rehearsed on the second day, they, it sounded fantastic. And then when we hit it live, it got lost a little bit. Like I opened with Drown in My Own Tears, the Ray Charles song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I loved it. The way it's supposed to be played was not the way it was played because they got ahead of it. It's like it's supposed to be this long and they were playing it in halves, you know, like it's hard to explain but the right. chords were falling in the wrong place and I was like mortified at first. And then I just continued on to try to bring it back in and mm -hmm. it finally got brought back in where it belongs. Yeah, I could tell that. I could yeah. tell that when the song first started. It seemed like the it was what the leads you were laying in were out of sync just a little bit, they but were, then you they brought were, it yeah. back in. I brought it I brought it around. Well you have to do that. I mean you gotta know how to do that. But um, Well it takes a pro to be able to recover like that too though. Well, you know, I'm a pro. I've been doing this quite a few years. Yeah. So Yeah, it was a it was a fun night. Um to get back to Dada, um the Scarlet and Sheba thing, I, I, that was one of my favorite stories in the book. I, mean, uh -huh. I, I got a good laugh out of reading about that. Oh, good, good. And um, so then, next is probably my favorite, this is probably my favorite song on the album because I just love how clever it is, and that's I Love America. Fantastic. We, we did a show about like patriotic songs last uh -huh. year, and I, pl I ended the show with that song. Because <laughs> I was like, and the, all the pop culture references in it are, just, yeah. are hilarious. It is great. And it, that brought me back to my childhood. I was talking to like watching the A team on Tuesday nights. Right, and, right. and I was like, wow, I remember that. You know? <laughs> right. But uh, some of the funniest lyrics on the and that's like, this is the most lighthearted track on the whole album. Yeah, yeah. And from a lot of reviews I read, people are saying, this is such a dark album, and there's a lot of you know heavy subject matter, but this song sticks out. It's like here's Alice's old sense of humor coming back. Exactly, you know? and he wrote this uh, great lyrics. Yeah.
It's our Fourth of July sale here at Coop's Carnival of Fling Classic Cars at the corner of Collins and Collins. I got a lot full of the finest one little cars money can buy. It's the prices even you can afford. So come on down and say hello to me and Granny and bring the kids to meet my snake. I say bye. Granny says bye, and the snake says. I love General Patton in World War II. My pocket kissing and in my crazy glue. I love the team and Wally too. Yeah. I love the palm, hot dogs, and mustard. I love my girl, but I sure don't trust her. I love what the Indians did to Custer. Was that anything that you guys felt like, okay, we got this album and it's all these deep, heavy, you know, songs, we need something more like this? Or was it more natural that it came together that way? Well, it started by uh, Alice and I coming up with the song and in the morning. Bob had this guy down there who was programming the Fairlight. And we started messing with the song and then it was the part where you had to have the Cowboys and Indians. Yeah. 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 Here they come. And that's all done on a synthesizer. Yeah, okay. There oh, they go. The, <laughs> yeah, there yeah. they come, here they go. Yeah. And then this, the, the, and then the guns used car sales. Yeah. And then the, yeah, the blowout sale. Right. <laughs> and the snake says, <laughs> Yeah. I love that. <laughs> that was great. That was great. You guys must have been laughing in the studio oh, yeah. when that one was You're being crazy, man. It just, it was hilarious. This whole album just gives me a vibe that it must have been so much fun to create this without any kind of pressure saying, hey, this we, was the we best. want to I got to sit more. behind the board and, you know, Bob was sometimes going and I would do the production and that's why I'm credited on it. Mm -hmm. But um, just sit there with my guitar and play all these tracks. It was just total freedom. Yeah. Know? It's like a playground. Yeah. 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 And it started that way with the actual writing of the songs. Right. You know, we just let it go and come up with this kind of stuff. I mean, it doesn't make sense if you're trying to write a commercial album because it's just too too good and too out there. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. This well, you album, got expectations put on you then, too. You know, where it's like, hey, we need two hit singles off this album. You know, yeah. we, who cares what the rest of it is, but you got to have those hit singles. You know, it feels like then, you know, your commercial hit, writing is like, you know, I mean, I hate it. I, I hate write, trying to write hits. Well, even stifling when, to even the artist, I do right? once in a while. Right. Know? I hate thinking about that as a motivation because when a, to me a hit is an album that, that people love. Yeah. yeah. That's and how you have it. That's the hit. You know, it isn't like a, I hit the top ten and I should get a gold record. Or none of that it means anything. It's, it's all there in the music. Yeah. You can see all those lyrics and hear that record and know that there's a lot of love and um, some deep thinking and deep feeling in it, putting it together. It's a masterpiece. Yeah, and also like, who says I'm going to write a hit? It's not. It's, it's like it's not up to the artist. It's up to the public. Right. You know? That's right. And the and like record companies forget that. Yeah. They're like, okay, we're going to manufacture. That's all the writers. Oh yeah, but they come through yeah. and have to pick one out, and they say, okay, this is going to be our sing single, you know, or however, yeah. you know, they work out that if way. And for songwriters, see, it's like this: if, if you were writing for today's market, yeah, you write a song that is similar to this guy and that guy who just had a big hit. Yeah. Okay, you write it. It's similar. It sounds like it's a hit. You get it recorded, you put it out. By the time you do it, it's a year later. Right. Yeah. And the trend has changed. It's over. You're too yeah. far behind no, the game. If, if you're ever writing for the current market, you're always writing for the wrong purpose. Yeah. You have to write for you. Mm -hmm. What turns you on as an artist, what brings out your artwork. You know? Right. You have to be able to do that and forget about the current market and let the market come to you. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but this was so. But this album is almost a passion project because it's it, it like, feels like let, it let's just get yeah. together and write what we want to write and screw right. the record cover. We don't That's need right. it. Right. So, um, what about what's going on with Fresh Blood? What, what's the story behind this song? Is well, it, it is about a vampire. You know. Okay. A vampire with a beat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, Prakash came in on this one and played bass, and I didn't play bass on this song. But he did. And yeah. That amazing bass line and that whole feel is uh, it's me and Ezra really writing that feel. I thought the guitars I played on it were uh, really perfect, just uh, 
light fender sound, just uh, not trying to amaze anybody with anything, just something really simple in and out of there. Mm -hmm. And then a little Beatles uh, on that finger picking thing from one of the Beatles songs. I didn't uh, pick up on that. Yeah, yeah I, I, I can see what you're da saying. Doo, da, 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 da. What was that song? Yeah, I mean, it was one of the John Lennon songs. And I can't think of it right now. No, oh, okay. But I, I did that kind of guitar part of it. And I thought that was really cool. And yeah. the rest of it, the guitar was real uh, kind of ethereal but funky. The moon lit streets for somebody that's So that was like the overall production feel for that song, to have that kind of feel. And then Alice made up the, the vampires. Right. The uh, the guy that had the whole theory on what the concept yeah. was, he's he's saying that it, like that there's some of these songs are he because his theory on Scarlet and Sheba was Sonny finds two girls that are willing, has sex with them, then kills them, and. Uh, you know, filled with, with lyrics about bondage, and then Fresh Bloody says, "Here's another murder song, except on a larger scale, detailing the hunger for blood and the ruthlessness and random randomness of victims." So he's making it out like a serial killer with multiple personalities, is what the album is about. I suppose. Huh? I suppose it could be. But I guess See, this, this is what's great right? about albums. Yeah, it's like uh, an album like you this can make it what you want it to be. That's yeah, exactly. Yeah. What does it that's, mean to that's you? That's a good thought process. I think that's. It's an interesting idea. Yeah, I mean, you can take it that way and interpret it that way. Because ultimately, anybody can do that with any song. Because you know what the artist may have written or had in mind when he created the song or the team created the song may not necessarily reflect that way exactly to the listener because every listener is an individual person with different perspectives on things so it means a million different things to a million different people. Yeah, that can be true. Unless, of course, you do a written experience to it. Then it doesn't mean nothing then to anyone. Means nothing <laughs> anything, exactly. <laughs> Ooh, baby. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I love these interpretations from fans who... You're going to love the next one. Who take the time <laughs> to actually look into this and feel something from it. See, that's got to be as about as flattering as it gets. I'd say somebody Fantastic. took this and they took the so to do far and they wrote into a whole it. book on it. Yeah, this it. guy wrote a long thing. And so what's next? Okay, the last song on the album, Pass the Gun Around. Love it. This is his interpretation. He says, here's our climatic ending, in which comes a point of realization for Sonny. He sobers up and wakes up in a hotel room surrounded by the dead bodies of his killing spree. <laughs> He wants to kill himself and let everyone that made, that made him what he was get their shot at him. Pass the gun around, give everyone a shot, give everyone a shot. Throw me in the local river, let me float away. Pass the gun around. Extremely sad and heartfelt song. As mentioned, and then he says, I mentioned above, Alice's fight for his life are really present in these lyrics, and you sympathize with them. Right, well, you do it with the alcoholism. Is, you do. As amazing as this song is, musically and lyrically, this is a heartbreaking song to listen to when you think of what he was going through at that time. Because this yeah. album pretty much sent him into rehab. He was killing himself on alcohol. Right. Did he realize it? I mean, or was he, he well, just he having a good time? It was finally brought, I mean, he. He wasn't having a good time. He was having a bad time. And he was desperately drunk. And he had uh, this guy, Landy, this, the guy that treated Brian Wilson, yeah. the psychiatrist, traveling with him and feeding him pills. And he was drinking, he had pills and he was drinking it. He was working with Alice? Yeah, he oh, was. Oh, I didn't know we that. We went to Australia and um, I had to call Shep and say, you got to get this guy over here, man. He's feeding Alice pills. Um, just trying to keep him sober to go on stage was, oh. it was almost impossible and so he was desperate you know, and they finally got him to go into rehab and of course his life has completely changed now. Oh yeah. yeah. He's so, totally straight. Yeah, he's and, doing great. And he's doing great, he's doing better than ever and 
if this song passes on, that's exactly what it was. It was a, a cry out about dying from alcohol. Yeah, so this song is basically him realizing how he bad really, shape yeah, he was yeah, in. Yeah. Was this written near the end of the time you guys were doing the record? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. things were coming to a head when this was made. Yeah, I think that was a, you know, the culmination of his real life. Because he and I were talking every night mm -hmm. you know, about his alcoholism and how he was being treated by management and other people. And, uh, just, you know, he, we really got in some in-depth conversations. So right. I, I don't know how to repeat, but that song came out at the end of the mm -hmm. So, so you, you, I mean, you, this was almost therapeutic for him to I work think. through a lot of things. I think so. So it's an interesting album in that regard, too, because who knows? I mean, going through this process with you and all working these things out in his head could have been what saved him and got him to go into rehab and get cleaned up. Because I mean, like he hurt. especially if he had the wrong influences around him, yeah. steering him the wrong way. Well, it's, he'd already been in rehab a couple of times. He'd been in point, rehab, right? but but he because of going to Toronto and he didn't want to go. Yeah, he started drinking. Uh, oh yeah, so the old and he had stopped came drinking for a little while, mm. and he immediately started drinking. Right, and I gotta say I was probably supportive of it in a way because I drank with him. Right, but. Uh, but I was never really a drinker, so yeah. So the alcohol was, I, I want to say fun, but it was wasn't that much fun either. Was, you know, we, we were like drunk every day. Right. Yeah. And I'd fall into bed drunk, wake up drunk, and but then I got you know, black forest cake. So, you know. Yeah. So, so we we created a lot at the time, even. There were no drugs, there was no cocaine around. I was going to ask about that because I know the early 80s were difficult for Bob with a cocaine problem. Because yeah, I've heard numerous well, stories about too. that. Yeah. Me too. So, yeah, many what, years of, yeah. of drug addiction. Right. And uh, What the heck are black forest cakes? It's a cake. It's a piece of cake. Black forest cakes. Chocolate and raspberry and something else. It's called black forest cake. I thought it was going to be like a piece of black forest cake. No, I don't think so. Try I thought it. you were like talking about it was Try like it. a name for hash or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had my black no, forest cake, man. I was good. <laughs> no, no black forest cake. You got to try it sometime. Huh. I'm going to have to. Yeah, listeners, listen, Indoors. check out black forest cake. Before we get off past the gun around, I have to compliment you. This is one of the best guitar solos I've ever yeah, heard. Yeah, for you. sure. I, anytime somebody wants an example of a great solo, I play this. It's great. It's, Thank it's you, one of your best pieces of work. I feel very good about it too. It was, it was just great when I, when we got the, the delays set on it. Yeah. So it was just right. And it just it just builds and builds. Yeah, it's a real high point in the album. Yeah. So I mean that's that's the nine song. I wanted to talk to you about a couple of things on a side note. The um, you did this at partially at ESP Studios in Buttonville, Ontario. Um, there's a quote in here from a, a man named John Jones, one of the co-owners of the studio. Uh -huh. And I don't know if you've heard this or not, but this let me just read you the quote. He says, I was a co-owner along with D. Long of the band Klaatu of ESP Studios in Buttonville. Alice was with us for over a month in the early 80s, and he and I spent many hours together hoping Bob would stay busy in the studio rather than come out to the front of the old barn and tear Alice's head off for not having a lyric ready that Bob liked. Um, and he says, many pages of very cool words were crumpled up and thrown in the bin. And he says, it was, many out insane, it was an insane time with many hours of grueling programming of the Fairlight CMI. And he says that as it turned out, when the album was delivered to WB, they were not expecting them to record an album. They thought Bob and Alice would just take the budget and that would conclude the years of recording that he did with formerly right. Warner Brothers. Right. So, um, and then he said, Alice, Bob, and Dick were our first real clients in ESP Studio. They gave us credibility in the Toronto music business, as well as teaching us all a million lessons in music recording and especially Alice life. I haven't seen him since 1981 or so. When I lived in England, I tried to call him a number of times but never got through in my career in D's. We never forget the role the three mad superstars played in our ever-evolving musical lives. <laughs> So, so you made an impact, that's yeah. for sure. I thought that was a nice quote from Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, so... Um, well, it, that was great. Yeah, and then a, an interesting credit on the album is special thanks to Judge Joseph A. Wapner. <laughs> so was people court, dun, dun, people's dun. court on quite a bit during people's the time? People's court, Alice, 
It made everybody has to stand when Jeb, Judge Wapner was walking. <laughs> Seriously? Because he was always watching it. And if you were sitting there with him, everybody had to stand. <laughs> wow. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Well, I mean, his involvement in the television programs is like that. I mean, is he pretty obsessive about stuff like obsessive that? Obsessive about stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. That's funny, though. Yeah, yeah. but funny. Yeah. yeah so, so, did Judge Wapner ever send a thank you card or anything? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Get out of jail free card, Anna. Yeah, but the, so when this album, I mean, it's wrapped up, it's done. You turn it over to Warner Brothers. You know, they're not going to do anything with it. Was there any thoughts or even plans of maybe touring on this? No, never no. mentioned of it. No. So once this is wrapped up, then where does everybody go? I mean, Alice, what he goes back to rehab one more time? And is that how? He did eventually go back to rehab. Yeah. Yeah. He left from Toronto and went back to Phoenix, drinking. Right. And then they had to turn him around again. I forget whether we went to Australia after that or... Uh, I know they, we went to Australia when I was working on Mark Farner's album in Toronto. Mm -hmm. was producing his first solo album. I got a call. They wanted me to go to Australia with Alice. And I said, I can't. I can't leave here. I'm finishing this project. Mm -hmm. So Shep called me up and he said, I'll make you a deal you can't refuse. And he gave me like an astronomical amount of money per, yeah. day, per day. Right. And I had only two days left on the mixes of, of Mark, so I hurried as fast as I could, 24 hours a day, working on that album right. to finish it. I finished it at 8 o'clock in the morning. I went to the airport and flew 40 hours oh. to Perth, Australia to join them. Was this for because Alan shows? said he would not do this to him uh -huh. unless I was there. So you guys were still able, I mean, it, Dada wasn't a big hit in the United States, but it got some good attention in the UK. Was it getting good attention in Australia too? Is that why you guys know. were able to... I don't know, but we went for a tour there. We took Nightmare there again. Yeah, oh, okay. so you guys didn't play nothing off the Dada album. No, nothing's ever been played We never off. played anything live off Dada. Was there ever any discussion saying, hey, maybe we should put Scarlet and Sheba in a set? Nothing like that? No. no. All that stuff about what they're going to do live takes place in other places. Yeah. You know, it has nothing to do with me. Yeah. They just pay me, I play guitar, I do, do my, put on my best show, do the best I can do, and uh, then we go home. You know, it's pretty cut and dry business. So, like I said, when you, when you guys were putting it together, you knew Warner was not going to push it. So, when it didn't do much, you were probably like, well, I'm not surprised anyway. Right, yeah. I wasn't surprised. I yeah. mean, uh, there was bad blood at Warner Brothers, really. And so the record got done, the contract was fulfilled, and then Alice started doing stuff for other labels. Yeah. And did you stay in contact with him after that? Well, I'm still in contact. Oh, I know you are now, but like during that comeback during period, Was this yeah. your first, like, last, or I should say last full album with Alice? I think for this a while? was the last yeah. one. I, I'm trying to remember the sequence, but... Do you know the sequence? This was the last full one you did with him. Yeah. The last yeah. full one. And, and then that, you came back to do help work on Brutal Planet. No, I didn't work on Brutal Planet. Oh, I thought Planet. you no, I'm thinking of the wrong album. No. Uh, or was no. it uh no you did Hey Stupid, you did Hey uh, Stupid and Might as well, well be on Mars. Mars. That's a great yeah. song. Yeah, that was a good song. That started out as, I wrote that that melody and the first couple of verses as another whole song that I had written I wrote it back in the, in the early eighties. Oh, I, wrote really? that, I wrote that piece of music, the, the, like the, the melody and everything for it. Mm -hmm. And then I brought it to Alice and we turned it into Might as well be a Mars. Well, that's why when I, hear, when I first heard it, I was like, okay, this sounds like old school Alice on, a, you know, on an album that sounded more new school because it stood out. Yeah. When I heard it, I was like, this sounds like the classic well, It's one of style. our best songs. Yeah, yeah Because that, that album really does have a contemporary feel for the types of metal bands that were out at that time. That right? yeah. Except for that song. That song, that song sounds out. like it would fit in more around this era yeah. than it did at yeah. what was yeah. going on at that time. That's a great melody. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah I wrote that, that the whole opening. Uh, Taxi Driver, Swerving Lane to Lane. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a part of another song that I wrote for, my, for a girlfriend that was giving me a hard time. Oh, okay. But, <laughs> Do you uh, find that works when your girlfriend's giving you a hard time? You oh, write yeah. her a song, she gets off your case? case. I, I write, <laughs> no, I just write good songs when I'm... When you're pissed? <laughs> either pissed or despondent. Yeah. yeah. It, it doesn't bring out it good depends. stuff. <laughs> you know, sometimes they break your heart and you write great songs. 
Sometimes they fuck around on you and write great songs. Right. Yeah. Sometimes they piss you off and write great songs. So my relationship with females is it varies a little, you know. Sometimes right. sometimes I love them and I write great love songs, sometimes I, I fucking hate them. And, <laughs> and I still write a great song because yeah. Just in a different way. <laughs> I like the one you did last night about messing around with another man's woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's a good, that's a good Put blues. Put your dick in the dirt. That was fantastic. <laughs> so to to wrap things up, it seems like Dada is a, is a particularly special album to you. It is. Yeah. It's very special to me. It's it's it was not my favorite. I think it is my favorite Alice Cooper album. Yeah. Um, Nightmare. Also, I mean, you gotta right. love the, the thing that launches the whole sure. your whole career, basically. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I love going to hell too. I think that's a good record. Yeah, yeah I like that one a lot. Um, what else did I do with it? I did well. From the inside. That is a classic. Yeah. That I would say you could actually, honestly, put on the Beatles a Abbey Road mm -hmm. and play that right after it, mm -hmm. and you'd have the same aura. Right. It's that good. Mm -hmm. It really is that good. Absolutely. That was with David Foster and uh, me and Alice and uh, who else is writing with us? Uh, Bernie Toppin. Bernie Toppin, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, there's a... Like, how are you going to yeah. see me now? That song, yeah. for instance. Right. I was at the piano. Bernie and Alice walk in with this lyric from, from the inside. Mm -hmm. And I just sat there and just read those lyrics and just... That was it. It was written like in ten minutes. Yeah. It just is such a natural song. Wow. And uh, I knew that was a hit as soon as that was done. It's like, wow, this is the song. It seems like the best stuff comes out that way too. It's like it just comes out of you, you know. I, yeah. I can't explain it's it. It's almost like it's from some a, different source bringing it out of it, you. It is sort of. Yeah. yeah. So um. Kind of like a don't overthink it kind of a thing. Just I don't think about it at yeah. all. I just let it flow from my heart, whatever that is. Well, you know, I'm I'm glad we got to do this again with you. And uh, a few months ago, I sent you a message on Facebook and had my fingers crossed. And I was like, do you want to talk about Dada? And you were like, yeah, it's one of my favorite albums. I was like, because <laughs> awesome. like, some people you don't know. Some people are like, oh, I wish I'd never done that album. You right, know? exactly. So. <laughs> no, no, this I'm very proud of the Dada album. Good. And, uh, well, I know a lot of uh, fans of yours and Alice Cooper are going to be happy to hear all these behind the scenes stories of thanks the album. For, thanks for talking to me again. Oh. I enjoyed it. I hope I didn't cry too much. No, but I But you made me tear up. Well, I'm, oh, well I'm, that's, hey, that's, the, uh. that's the emotion that came out on the album, right? I think, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah it takes an emotional person to be able to create this kind of stuff, you know, and, and it shows in you that you got so much love for the music and so much power in your creativity that, you know, whether it's live on a stage or, or creating in a studio, Dick, you've come out with some amazing stuff over the years. And, you know, I speak thank on you. behalf of the fans of our show here. You know, we appreciate you and we thank you very much for all you've well, done. thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Got you. It, man. Thanks, Chris. Oh, no problem. Thanks for I doing this I appreciate you guys. You guys are amazing.